Hey David, <clears throat> hope you're well. Now, um, what I need to do is just need to change some of you guys to an attendee. There you go, perfect. <clears throat> so, everybody that's here, if we just use some of the chat functions just to make sure uh, you can hear me uh, in here, basically, in here. There you go. Just let me know if you can hear the... And then we'll... Uh, We'll get going. We just got a couple of uh, minutes. What I'll do? Let me. <clears throat> While we're doing this, I'll just share my uh, share my screen. There we go. So basically, this is going to form the basis of what we're going to talk about this evening. And we'll get started in a little while. And uh, there we go. Perfect. Hey, David, how are you? It all worked out fine in the end. Yeah, brilliant. Okay. That's good. That's good. It's all working. Excellent. Well, I don't know where everybody is from, but in England, it's 10 o'clock at night. And uh, I guess we're not that far away from another lockdown, I guess, because this bloody virus is, uh, is killing everybody. And for some people, uh, that's not a pun. Right. It's 10 o'clock, uh, everybody who's on time is on time, and those that are not will catch up later. Okie dokie. Yeah, demos in London. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's a crazy world that we're living in with this virus, and um, I can't see it getting any better in the near term, so... I guess we're going to have to live with it uh, and I'm sure that over the winter things are going to be uh, a bit of a disaster. But anyway, right. Let's crack on. Uh, yeah, Horatio, so basically because you can if you want, uh, I already record these things to the cloud and then give you guys access to it later. So what I tend to do, this will go uh, onto a Zoom cloud and then I upload it to my YouTube channel. And for people that have paid to attend it, uh, they get access to it. It's like, a, it's recorded as a private video. And then uh, you, can, uh, you can watch, couldn't access the last, could you not, David? <coughs> <coughs> now the virus has got me. Um, did you, um, did you attend the last, sorry, uh, if you, if you didn't, let's, exactly, okay, what I'll do, I'll send an email to everybody, uh, it wouldn't, yeah, 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 okay, right, sorry, let's take this offline, uh, and I'll deal with it, I'll deal with it at the end, uh, 
when everybody has joined in, I'll tell everybody at the end how to get on. But basically, uh, and I'll, I'll explain what that means, but let's, let's not get distracted too much. Uh, we'll, we'll crack on with the seminar. And remind me at the end, and I'll tell you how to get the recording. But everybody, everything will be fine, I'm sure. Okay, good. Everyone's happy. <clears throat> right. Introduction. So, hopefully this isn't going to be death by PowerPoint. I use this PowerPoint presentation more than anything just to keep my mind focused on what I'm trying to get across. And um, on this page, you can see that the agenda for this evening, we're going to have a real quick recap of the issues that people generally have with gyroplanes in the takeoff and landing phase. Then we're going to talk about the fact that some of these takeoff accidents where the blades flap, uh, that's not a rotor management issue. I'll explain why. Then we're going to come on to some common themes with general errors, uh, mental capacity and checklists. And then we're going to talk about rotor management. <clears throat> I've got a bit of a cough. Would you believe my, my daughter went back to her little play group? Hello, Ken. I'm just going to change you to an attendee. <coughs> there you go. Yeah, my, um, <clears throat> my daughter, she went back to her play group and like all these, these kids, they pick up germs when I've just got a bit of a cough and a sniffle. Anyway, just for Ken's benefit, Ken, I was just saying to the guys, uh, the agenda for the evening, quick recap, takeoff and landings. Uh, why I don't think blade flapping during the takeoff is anything to do with rotor management. Uh, common themes of the errors. A, a, a quick recap about mental capacity and checklists. And then we're going to get into uh, rotor management. Okay, so. Uh, what goes wrong in landings? Well, for those of you with me last time, you'll be familiar with this slide. and I'm just going to quickly run through things. The big four or five themes are the early uh, things to highlight. One of the big issues most pilots have, and it's generally not just gyroplane pilots, but helicopter and fixed wing pilots, and that is, is that they make inconsistent final approaches. And the problem with making inconsistent final approaches is that no two landings are ever really the same because, you know, sometimes, if this is my runway, sometimes people approach on final and they're quite tight into the runway. Sometimes they're a lot further away. Sometimes they're lower, sometimes they're higher. Sometimes they're faster, sometimes they're slower. And all these changes and differentiations mean that it's difficult to build a mental map of what you're needing to do and what the visual cues look like. So whenever it's possible, you should always try and make a consistent final approach. And that starts from when you turn base, because obviously it's when you turn base that dictates how near or far away you are from the end of the runway uh, when you turn final. And obviously if you can make consistent height and consistent speed, when you get to the bottom and you're trying to present the aircraft onto the runway, it should be, uh, it should look and feel the same all of the time. So consistent approaches are probably the number one uh, failure across all aviation. The next issue that is quite specific to gyroplane uh, and is specific to gyroplane more because if you're in a fixed wing, uh, if you fly slow approaches at some point you're going to get close to the stall and people tend not to like getting close to the stall. So actually if you're in a fixed wing or if you were a fixed wing pilot, one of the errors that is typical for fixed wing pilots, actually they fly their final approach too fast and then they've got too much energy 
in the final elements over the runway and it just floats for a long time. Gyroplanes don't float, they're so draggy. So as soon as you get the thing, if that's final, our angle on final approach and we're gonna try and present onto this runway, the danger is you get very slow or people get obsessed with making these glide approaches. And I'll talk about that in a minute and I'll show you a bit of a film as to what goes wrong at the bottom. Uh, you can always make an aggressive flare or round out too high and typically when those things happen they're recognized and it encourages a big power change uh, late on which then means you get a lot of your change because power changes with gyroplanes tend to make the aircraft uh, your. There are some other things that are a little bit less um, uh, obvious or less impactful. You know, like, so for example, uh, a lot of people bash the circuit and then uh, having bashed the circuit, and what I mean by bashing the circuit, they're, they're doing consistent patterns or circuits and they do five or six, they get tired, uh, not just uh, physically, but me more, more mental. And then they just make mistakes. And then because they don't like to end their session on a low with a mistake, they try again. And then they just make even more mistakes and sometimes that goes wrong and then they crash. And then there's other issues like uh, we get some, sorry, we get some crosswind elements and we get yaw and drift and uh, and so on however i've got this little graphic and this comes with a video and this is what i mean where it tends to be a lot of pilots that try and uh, fit into this narrative which is certainly something that's quite it is a bit prevalent in the uk which is they like to fly like a gyroplane pilot. And what that means is, is that because a gyroplane can, you know, do very low speed vertical type descents and land on a sixpence, some people think that you have to do every single landing uh, utilizing all of that aircraft capability. And if you don't, then you're not flying like a gyroplane pilot. And the problem is, is that, of course, I'm going to use a car or an automotive analogy here, because I think even if we're a student of gyroplanes, we're probably quite familiar with things in an automotive context. So, uh, we all may know as car drivers what understeer and oversteer is so understeer is where you turn the steering wheel and the rate of change of the wheel isn't giving the same amount of directional change to the nose of the car so the car is pushing off the opposite of that is oversteer so we're turning that way and then suddenly we need some opposite lock because the rear of the car is uh, effectively steering more than we require and we turn into the slide otherwise we spin now in automotive terms we might talk about understeer and oversteer and some drivers if i said to my mom my mom for example about understeer or oversteer she wouldn't have a clue what i'm talking about so the first thing is is to understand the terminology and very often pilots can understand the terminology, but then we move to number two, which is we may know what understeer and oversteer is, but can we do it? And often in automotive, we might be able to create some understeer or some oversteer, but then we move on to the third thing, which is can we do it well? Because just because we could create understeer or oversteer in our car, we might create some understeer and just crash, or we might create some oversteer and crash. So 
we need to recognize what it is then we need to be able to do it then the third thing is we need to be able to do it well and that is where this kind of problem comes in our gyroplane context because just because we can do it doesn't mean to say that either we should do it all the time or we can do it well all of the time and also just because it's something that's been hypothesized about or spoken about by an instructor and most instructors have got you know beyond a thousand hours of experience in a gyroplane alone just because your instructor can do it doesn't mean that your student pilot or freshly qualified pilot or and when i say freshly qualified i don't mean you know you qualified last month or last year what i mean to say is maybe you qualified five or six years ago but if you don't keep flying if you haven't built your hours or built experience very often your skills have degraded so with all that said let me show you one of the issues with um, let me just get this ready the right okay here we go okay so i'm just going to show you some issues here I'm going to swap screens, stop sharing screens, so you're back with me. I'm going to share another screen. Can you see my, uh, oh, what can you see here? No, I don't know what you can see here. Why right, hang on. Okay, so you can see my, um, there you go. So, what we're looking at now, this is in the States. Uh, this pilot was doing some, uh, not quite glide approaches, but very steep approaches. And what I want to show, what I want you to focus on is uh, the round out and see how inaccurate these steep approaches uh, make the round out. And it's because the pilot's trying to pull the aircraft. He sees the ground rushing up towards him. He pulls back on the stick, but he doesn't do it very accurately. And then see how the aircraft reacts uh, after that initial back stick. So I'll prompt you as it comes. There won't be any sound. So here we go. We're coming down, we're coming down. See, there you go. Now there's the lowering the nose to gain some extra airspeed with our glide approach <clears throat> and because we've lowered the nose you can see the attitude of the aircraft is quite steep nose down and that encourages this overreaction at the bottom so here we go look see now it's starting to round out but see now it just balloons slightly and now actually we've still got a little bit of speed so we're okay but you can see that we're probably five feet above the runway. And if we were to get slow at this point, we're just going to fall out of the sky from five, you know, four or five feet. Now, actually, you may get away with falling out of the sky at four or five feet if you've got good yaw control and no drift. But you can see how easy it is for people to screw things up at that point. So there you go, he persists and we land. Now we'll show another one, look, there's, there's the big pull and there, let, let, me just, let me just replay that because this one's a much better example. Look, see the big pull away, oh, too much now balloon, look. And now look, we're probably, you know, six or seven feet off the runway. And at this point, if we've got slow, then we're definitely gonna hurt ourselves. Here you can see the big yaw change. That's because we've added a whole bunch of power because the instructor in the back has got nervous. 
So he's booted in the power to try and do a go around or to cushion the landing. And there's that big yaw change. Now you can see a new pilot trying to emulate the fly like a gyroplane pilot. He got to this point, and if that aircraft touches down like that, then you crash. There's no question. So there you go, look, the yaw comes back in, but we're still, now we're getting slow, and boom, down she goes. So, back with me, and my sweet eating face. Where's the PowerPoint? There's the PowerPoint. So, that's why I caution against all of this very steep sort of idle descent uh, and slow um, and getting slow on vinyl because a lot can go wrong and a lot does go wrong. Uh, in actual fact, um, there's an instructor in the States based over in California. He's a bit of a funny guy. And um, I'm constantly uh, amazed at how he is unable to see the fact that people can get snagged it's not very complicated things, it's normally very easy things, and it's not the fact that they cannot be done well, because clearly you can land very well like this. But if you're not practiced, or you're not um, experienced, then you can get snagged. And actually, this pilot from, or this instructor pilot from California, he recently was flying in Mentone in a single seater, that he hadn't had any differences training on and damaged the aircraft in a landing uh, accident. And it just goes to show that it's the simple things that always snag people. So we're now talking about what goes wrong with takeoff. And uh, typically it's over rotation. Can also be blade flap. Uh, I'll explain what I mean by that later. Climbing out behind the drag curve, uh, many people know this as behind the power curve. Uh, those who are regulars with me know that I don't like that term because actually it is the drag curve that's the issue. Uh, some people just don't plan their flight very well uh, or they don't execute their takeoff very well and they just run out of runway. Some people get some yaw issues either through uh, a general loss of yaw control uh, or crosswind and obviously you can also have a, a genuine engine failure so this is some pictures of uh when i said blade flap which is this one here uh, these are the consequences typically what happens is uh and i'll just turn in profile for you so you can see my hand movement Normally when we, we've done our pre-rotating and before we start the ground roll, the stick is all the way back in our tummy or our chest. Probably not our chest, the stick's not that high, but it is for, for this because you can see, see me in the, uh, in the camera. Stick's all the way back and therefore the rotor is inclined so that the wind is coming underneath the disc and accelerating the rotor. Some people, it's basically a mental capacity issue. You start with the stick fully forward because in a, especially in an auto gyro, and you'll notice that these are, that's a calidus, uh, that's a sport. The pre-rotation process is to start with the stick fully forward when you're pre-rotating and you only bring the stick back uh, at the end of that pre-rotation process. And basically just people forget to do that. So they set off down the runway with the stick fully forward. And what that means is the disc is very flat and there's no air going underneath the disc causing auto rotation. So the rotors start to slow down. And then at some point they've, the rotor RPM has decayed to such a degree that when they realize their error and they bring the stick back, the rotor physically can't flap out the dissymmetry of lift 
from left to right. And uh, first of all, uh, the rotor hits the teeter stop, which transfers that energy down the control rods into the stick. So the stick thrashes around. And also because the rotors have been physically constrained, so they can't flap out that dissymmetry of lift, the aircraft tends to roll over to the left. Uh, because they've got more lift on the advancing blade than the retreating blade, and that's the and that's the result. So, uh, if we go back to here, I said takeoff blade flap is not a rotor management issue, and the reason it isn't a rotor management issue is because the people that fall into this trap are not managing anything. It's just a pure mistake. They've not meant to do this. They've not tried to do something else and failed and ended up with this. All they've done is they've set off with the stick forward and they needed to start with the stick back and the rotor RPM has decayed. Ah, Cameron, I'm just going to change you to a, an attendee. There you go. So, so that's why I say it's not a rotor management issue because you're not managing things. There isn't really any management to do in that situation. It's just the fact that pre-rotation takeoff sequence has got muddled and they've screwed it up. I'll also want to talk to you an extension of this is to talk about some mathematics around how much of an error you have to have to create this. So, uh, I'm talking here about most factory, when I talk about factory built types, depending where you are in the world, depends on what that make and model means, but typically, um, I'm talking about autogyro, I'm talking about Magni, I'm talking about ELA, I'm talking about even things like Silverlight, um, uh, the ones in Australia, uh, that are, I think they're ground at the moment because they've got some rotor production issues or manufacturing issues, but anyway, anything that you buy that's effectively ready assembled and is two seat in tandem or side by side configuration have rotor diameters of around 28 feet. Now, if you use basic mathematics, which is uh, pi times the diameter, you get effectively 88 feet circumference. So basically, if one rotor RPM or one rotor revolution per minute means that the tip of each blade is going is traveling 88 feet uh, every minute so if you then extrapolate the maths and i won't insult your intelligence but basically one rotor rpm means that you've got one miles per hour at the tip so if you pre-rotate and typically pre-rotation for these things is around 200 to 220 i think if you fly one of these aircraft, that those numbers will be uh, broadly familiar. Then you've got a tip speed of between 200 and 220 miles an hour. Now, we know that, and this is an extract from the Autogyro Cavalon uh, pilot operating handbook. You can fly in a Cavalon and in fact, you can fly in all, it's consistent with all autogyro aircraft. Uh, and this number is also consistent with Magni. Uh, you can fly in 40 knots wind. So, if you're going to fly in 40 knots of wind, and you pre-rotate to 200, 220, it means 40 knots, I think, is about 46, 47 miles per hour. So that means when you pre-rotate, 
and you stood still, you've got a headwind component of about 46, 47 miles an hour, and you've got 200, 220 miles per hour at the tip of every, of, of the blades. So therefore, we can say we've got a tip speed ratio of spot two, three. So that means that we're safe to pull the stick all the way back as so long as we've got a tip speed ratio of spot two, three. So if we've got a tip speed ratio of spot two, three, and we're safe, then how on earth do we get to this situation? Good question. So I suggest that we've ended up getting somewhere between 36 and 40 miles an hour, but we've allowed the rotor RPM to decay to about 180. Because if you had got, for example, 250 rotor RPM, you would have to be doing 58 miles an hour of airspeed. So the airspeed indicator would have to be showing 58 miles an hour. And I, I think that's far, far too unambiguous for it not to be obviously wrong. I mean, it's just so enormous, that speed, you know, because don't forget, we're talking about operation with a 40 knot headwind. These guys, you know, that's not a 40 knot day. That's not a 40 knot day. You know, typically, well, we could bring up the actual accident report and find out what the wind speed was, but I bet, you know, it's somewhere between 15 and 20 miles an hour. So, you know, there's no way that these guys have accelerated to near 60 miles an hour and, and then sort of thought that that was uh, normal operation. So what they've done is they've just basically made a mistake They've allowed the rotor RPM to decay, and then they pulled the stick back, and it's gone wrong from there. So the thing that I always say to my students and to you guys is that when you're doing your takeoffs, even if you make a mistake with the stick, and of course these things, as I highlight here, they're unintended actions, they're lapses or they've slipped or a mistake, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But even if you've got the stick in the wrong position, so long as your process always includes looking at the rotor RPM gauge, you can never fall into the trap of destroying the blades that way because as soon as you see the rotor RPM gauge decay, then that's the trigger to just knock it off, you know, close the throttle. Uh, apply the wheel brake, get the aircraft to come to a complete stop, and you won't uh, you won't crash. So, <clears throat> just a quick talk about this. Why do we have these unintended actions of slips, lapses, or mistakes? Well, very often it's either the fact that we didn't know any better in the first place, and in some of these cases, I don't think that's the case because normally most people have gone through uh, a reasonable amount of pilot training and most instructors are reasonably consistent in what they're teaching. And certainly they're not going to teach leaving the stick fully forward to start the ground roll. Uh, but the other two issues are quite key and they are memory failures or attentional failures. Attentional failures are typically caused because you get distracted by a passenger or a radio or some other thing that's not going particularly well. So typically one thing in an auto gyro, which is distractional, is you've got a, a little knob on the, on the um, on the dash, which is uh, the road to brake and flight. And some people line up uh, on the runway and they forget to turn 
the knob from brake to flight so they don't pre-rotate. Then they realize, then they, they're all in a, in a massive panic rush trying to get this uh, remedied. And then of course that starts the, the clock uh, going on the fact that they're now gonna forget other things in their process. The memory failure is not helped by the fact that very often some people are working on massive checklists or their process to get airborne is overcomplicated. And so there's just too many steps in their process, which means that they're focused on, they are focused on something, but they're just focused on the wrong thing. And we'll talk about that in a minute. However, by far and away, one of the commonest themes of these kind of accidents uh, in general, not just the blade flap to take off, is inexperience. And to give you an example, this is the last gyroplane that was reported to have crashed in the UK. Uh, it happened on the 27th of May, which was literally a few days after everybody in the UK was allowed to go back to flying privately because of the virus. And you can see that, well, you can't see on this extract because I haven't included it, but basically uh, the pilot uh, had done a few circuits, then he'd gone off for a flight for the day or half a day or whatever, a couple of hour flight basically. And then he crashed uh, on his landing when you return home. You can see here in the UK, the AAIB, the uh, Air Accident Investigation Branch, uh, record last 90 days, last 28 days experience. And all these hours here, well, three of them were during that flight that he made, uh, that he was returning from where he crashed. And he basically got slow, um, and fell out of the sky, the yaw wasn't very well controlled, and it toppled over. Now, there is something that's interesting about the airfield that this guy operates from, which we'll talk about in a minute, but if you want to get a good idea around how much flying you should do, and that means hours versus uh, takeoffs and landings, this pilot currency barometer, which is from the British Gliding Association, is a reasonable good stick in the sand. They obviously use the word launches rather than takeoffs and landings uh, because they're glider pilots. But uh, what it aims to show is there's a, there's a differentiation between just doing hours uh, and also take off some landings. And the reason for that is, if you've got something like, for example, 737, you could probably fly certainly five, five plus hours in one go, but you wouldn't do very many takeoffs and landings. So that's why they're saying, look, you, here's the number of hours you've flown. This is the number of takeoffs and landings you've flown. And where are you on this sort of traffic light system? So you can see here, this guy, the, the, the example that they've given is they've said, look, uh, yes, you've done 25 hours of flying, which is in the green, but you haven't done that many takeoffs and landings, which means you're rusty. So somewhere that should highlight to the pilot if this was you, maybe your flight planning is probably quite good uh, and your situational awareness when you're aloft, but maybe you take off some landings are a bit flaky or could be better and you might want to do a circuit or two with an instructor. So <clears throat> just to continue the theme about what things can make you get snagged. Let me just show you. 
I will show you. Let me stop sharing one screen and share another. So you can see uh, this MT Sport. This is at the airfield that that pilot crashed at. It's not the accident aircraft. This isn't the accident, uh, but this is where that pilot flies from. Uh, and I want you to notice, see this, so that's a good picture, isn't it? So this is the actual, in fact, where that aircraft is coming from here, that's actually the direction uh, that our accident pilot was coming from. And you'll notice that there's this big white circle uh, with a painted G in the middle. Now, what pilots do at this airfield uh, as a little bit of sport and some banter is they try and challenge each other to make every landing almost a spot landing competition within this G or within the circle uh, that surrounds the G. As demonstrated, <coughs> excuse me, as demonstrated by this pipe here. And you'll see, when you make this, this is completely, I guess this is flying like a gyroplane pilot. And at some point it's wires or on the, on the go around, on the undershoot or the overshoot. And of course, I'm not saying that this is necessarily the cause of that pilot's problem. He was clearly rusty. But it is a fact that if you're trying to aim for a particular point and you get it wrong, naturally you're going to get slow. And if you get slow, and you've got it wrong and you're high, then it all goes badly wrong. Of course, if that was what this guy was trying to do when he returned, who knows? But he was hardly ever going to admit it to the AAIB. And it's the same with our Cavalon pilots. Now, this is a little table of global Cavalon accidents. Since 2012, uh, right up until the last one recorded here was uh, on the 4th of August 2020 with a pilot with less than 100 hours. And I highlight this because this is an increasing trend, certainly in the States, because Cavalon is relatively aggressively marketed. And because it is the first of the, uh, what they call, I'm not actually sure what the exact terminology is in America, but they're completely built factory aircraft. So you don't have to build them. You don't have to have any, you know, they're not kit built thing. They're not, um, they're not 51% new build and um, they're, they're complete. They're, they come complete from the dealer. And there's a, there's an instructor for auto gyro in the States called Bob Schneider. And uh, Bob likes to talk a good game about how flying a gyroplane, the wind doesn't make a lot of difference to these things. And you can get it all done if you're a current pilot in about 10 to 15 hours. That's, you know, and, and frankly, it's, uh, it's a, silly, a silly attitude and it's causing people all kinds of problems because uh, basically the last Cavalon, so 635 Brava Charlie, that pilot was previously a powered parachute pilot. So I guess what we might know in the UK as a paraglider. And he may well have been a fantastic paraglider pilot, uh, but 
he hadn't got very much experience on a gyroplane and unfortunately I think he was sightseeing uh, somewhere local to either his house or his friend's house. Uh, he got low and he got slow and the thing just got, you know, there was a lot of sink rate and he impacted terrain and destroyed the uh, aircraft. So what can you say? Earlier on, I talked about mental capacity and uh, these huge checklists or huge processes that people have uh, when, you know, they go flying. This is an extract from uh, Phil Harwood's methodology or IAPGT, Gyropedia, call it what you will. And, um, well, this you can read for yourself. This is his lesson 13. And this is just building rotor speed. And as you can see, there's just a, a ridiculous amount of individual steps and uh, things that you should say or articulate. And for me, it's insanity. It's complete insanity. You know, I'm not necessarily saying that some of these processes are not, uh, are not warranted. Uh, but what I'm saying is, for example, uh, here, look, we've already, we've already done the pre-rotation and then we're still checking, you know, where the wind is and what the runway is doing and so on. Now, of course, yeah, obviously, you don't set off if the runway isn't clear and if the passenger is screaming that they're suddenly ill. But if you're actually thinking that you're going to verbalize some of this all of the time, it's ridiculous because all it's doing is it's just filling your head with things that you should, you think you should be thinking about when actually, you know, you want to be thinking about the takeoff, stick position, uh, and, you know, what you're trying to achieve because some of this is just mental, mental clutter. Okay. Rotor management. Now, I dismissed earlier this idea about blade sailing during the takeoff process and saying that that wasn't rotor management because I felt that that's a mistake, as in the pilot's just not done the thing that he needed to do, and therefore he wasn't managing his rotors because he never, he wasn't managing anything. Rotor management really just comes down to two factors. One is the prevention of blade sailing, and I'll show a little video what that means, and the other is managing rotor thrust. Typically, the former, i.e. this bit about blade sailing, is when the rotors are stopped or they're at less than 150 rotor RPM. And that's just one caveat, that's referencing our factory built 28 foot diameter rotor. The rotor thrust, is when the rotors are beyond 150. So typically the first part is normally during taxiing to take off or the final part of the taxi back and the rotor thrust is the after landing uh, management of the rotors. Now I'm just gonna show you another little video. And um, I'm just going to show you another little video. Let me just <coughs> let me just stop sharing this and give you another film. 
So, as you can see, this guy is in a single seater. And you can see that his rotor management task is a lot more complex than it is when you're in a two-seater with a working pre-rotator. However, you can also see that this guy, because of the way the machine, the physical size and the geometry uh, and the kinematics of the aircraft, the blades, even with the stick all the way back, and at the moment that the stick is back, the blades are nowhere near the tail. And as you can see, this guy, he just started his engine there with the hand puller, and now he's getting strapped in. His rotor management is obviously, in some ways, slightly more complex than it is for us in a two-seater because a, he's got to get these blades up to speed. And B, he's got to get himself in. I mean, we just saw the palaver that this guy went through. Now, when you're in a two-seater, one of the issues that you can see is that our blades are a lot more flexible. This guy's just giving them a little bit of a whip. And you can see how much bending and articulation they'll do. And as he brings the rotor all the way around, to the rear, you can see that if you don't manage the rotors effectively, then it is definite that you're gonna hit the tail with those rotors and likely hit the prop. So that is the fundamentals of managing the blades uh, when the aircraft, let me just stop sharing that. So when we're taxiing with slow rotors or with the rotors stopped, we're absolutely worried about rotor to prop, rotor to bodywork uh, contact. And we're also worried about if this is a section of aerofoil, so that's the underneath of the that's the underneath of the blade, any any uh wind environmental wind you know the fact that it's 10 knots or in our poh for the cavalon could be 40 knots 40 knot wind hitting the underneath the under surface of the blade and either bending the blade or just moving the whole blade back obviously if it bends then that bending motion itself is going to add additional uh, latitude and could in, in itself mean that the blades hit the bodywork or the prop uh, or the tailplane or they physically move the whole uh, rotor that way and typically what tends to happen when you taxi is that because your process often is that you're still fiddling around maybe with the radio could be the volume could be the frequency uh, maybe you're trying to, you know, do a bit of cockpit management, you know, took a chart out of the way, or, uh, you know, maybe you did your belts a little bit tight and you're trying to get to the, the strobes or the, you know, the identification lights or something. And, uh, you know, all those things distract you. And all the while, either you find that actually, you know, most of us are right-handed, and so we're holding the stick with our right hand. Then we're trying to do something and juggle. And, and it's easy to either let go of the stick completely. And if no one's got hold of the stick and the wind gets under the blade, you know, that can be, that can be expensive. Or, you know, we relax our hand on the stick and then we're, we're allowing the, the, the rotors to move. So, for blade sailing, when the rotors are stopped, or less than 150, we very much need to know where the wind is coming from. Uh, and it's typically easier and safer just to get the blade stopped. So that basically means not necessarily the taxi to taking off, but after landing, 
we've we've landed and we've come off of the active runway i suggest to my new students stop there allow the rotors to wind down put the rotor brake on and then continue the taxi to parking because otherwise you know you're trying to very often during the taxi to park and you get radio communication with the tower um, and then there's other aircraft maneuvering which you've got to be you know they're all little things that can just distract and if you take your eye off the ball especially when the rotors are going very slow because when rotors go slow the function of that is that any uh, ambient wind is quite a, a significant factor with regarding angle of attack and the blade's ability to flap and articulate which is why those that are new to flying gyroplanes you'll find that sometimes when the rotors are sort of almost less than 50 rotor rpm and you're just trying to go and park suddenly the blades will have an almighty kick and you know the stick will have a massive kick and that's just because they're trying to flap out maybe a little gust or something. Uh, and of course that wind component now is a, is a, is a big, you know, big factor of the overall or a big part of the overall uh, total of airspeed that the blade is seeing. Uh, and if that wind is coming from a particular direction, then it, the, the blades can have a, a tough time flapping uh, out that dissymmetry of lift. So you do need to know where the wind is. Also, if you're taxiing on bumpy ground, uh, that's just a reference to the fact that, you know, you saw in that video, you know, the blades do flex quite a, quite a lot. And if you've got bumpy ground, that's just extenuating uh, that problem. You're just having an even bigger amount of uh, flap and flex. So again, it's safe to taxi with the blade stopped. And then the final element is talking about positioning the stick according to the wind direction. Now, I've made a little graphic uh, because it's easier to uh, highlight what we're trying to do here with our graphic. Uh, so this is our gyroplane in plan view. Uh, this is our wind from the left. This is our wind from the right. And this box here with arrows is just a small depiction of if you imagine uh let me just get this into shot right so there's there's my stick and uh let me try and get it on so there's my stick you can imagine if i put the stick into you know i can put the stick into any corner of the box that would be fully forward and central or i could pull the stick back and do it so that's my you know the the the, the movements of the of the stick or the potential movements of the stick and the little blue dot here is basically saying if the wind has got any, is from the left at all, then the, then the stick is fully forward and to the left. Now, I know there's been a trend that talks about the stick being fully forward and fully left in that scenario. And I don't, particularly care whether it's fully left uh, the one advantage for it being fully left is the fact that if you do find yourself faffing around in the cockpit if it's fully left you can tend to jam the control stick uh, with a knee because obviously you don't need very much fidelity uh, if it's all the way to the left so a knee can sometimes be helpful. The key part is, is the fully forward uh, and the left can be any, any, any amount left that you're comfortable with. Uh, likewise, if the wind's from the right, the stick is to the right and fully forward. And again, you could put it all the way to the right and use your knee to jam it in the corner, but it doesn't have to be fully to the right. The only snag with it being fully forward and fully right or fully forward and fully left is that if you get that modeled when you've got rotor RPM, 
then you're just going to roll the aircraft over. And this is the other part of rotor management, is managing the rotor thrust, because obviously, once you've landed, you've got significant rotor thrust to manage, and in that situation, the stick should always be fully forward and central. And obviously, if you model those two things and put it in one corner of the control box, when you've got big rotor RPM, then you just roll the aircraft. And I've had a student do that, actually. So it is possible to do. I'm not saying it's common, uh, but it's possible to do. And in truth, how common it is, is probably less known because it's unlikely, just like what happens with these people that crash on takeoff because they had the stick fully forward, they either don't know that they've done the wrong thing or they don't want to admit that they've done the wrong thing because they're just embarrassed. But rotor management, just to recap, there's two key elements to it. One is to stop blade sailing when the rotors are stopped or less than 150. Now, I'll just caveat 150. The reason I say 150 and not another number is because on the rotor taco of an auto gyro aircraft, 150 is marked. Some people, and I'm not trying to pick, I'm not trying to pick on these guys at IAPGT or whatever else they call themselves this week, but they use, I think, 120 or 130. And the problem with using a number like that is that, well, I haven't got a graduation on any aircraft that I know that's 120, 130. So you may as well use something that's relevant. Um, and you won't roll over at 150, so don't worry about that. So, it's blade sailing when the blades are stopped or slow, and the stick is towards the wind and fully forward. So there's the wind, stick is towards the wind and fully forward. There's the wind, towards the wind and fully forward. When you've got rotor thrust, i.e. when the rotors are beyond 150, then the, the, the worry is rolling the aircraft over and the stick is fully forward and central regardless of where the wind is. It doesn't matter if the wind is here, from here or from here, it's always fully forward because you do not want to uh, deflect the rotor thrust and then roll the aircraft. Obviously the wind wouldn't be up the tail at this point because you don't land downwind. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Obviously when the rotors are stopped or they're very slow, you could end up with a tailwind, especially if you're taxiing or backtracking uh, to an active runway, that's perfectly possible, but you still keep the stick fully forward, as in you don't pull the stick back to try and deflect the, the, the rotor to where the wind is. The stick always remains forward and always towards the wind, even if that's, uh, you know, these arrows come all the way around here with a tailwind component. And that would only really be impactful uh, when you're taxiing to, to take off or to, or to park. Obviously, you know, if you're at the apron and you can't see the windsock, when you call on the radio or when you drove into the airfield or when you see other people taking off and landing, you can use that as a, as a good benchmark. Okay, so that, is rotor management, and it is that simple. There are literally, there's, it's, no, it's not more complicated than that. There's literally 
nothing more complex than that. Obviously, all of these metrics, the good thing is we're referencing the rotor RPM, uh, which means that we need to know where that rotor RPM taco is, but that's also a good thing because when we do our takeoff, we're also in these kind of aircraft, we're also referencing an actual number uh, to make sure that the rotor RPM doesn't, de doesn't decay. Certainly, in my opinion, uh, I wouldn't want to see the rotor RPM decay less than 180. And then if it was, I'd, I'd be looking to stop, actually. I wouldn't persist with the rotor RPM uh, down near 180. OK. Are there any questions? Let me come back to me. Any questions? Any questions? I'll give you a little bit of time to, you can either type them in here in our Q&A. Ah, uh, yeah. Sorry. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. So, uh, record it. How to get a, a, a recording of the presentation. So, basically, this presentation is uh, recorded in the cloud via Zoom. Uh, I can probably, within, by tomorrow morning, Zoom will send me an email saying, because it's, because we've already been going over an hour, it takes a while for them to download it themselves or to upload it. Uh, I can give you instant access to that, or the alternative way most people, what we do is I take that recording, upload it to my YouTube channel, and then grant you guys access uh, to that YouTube uh, copy uh, via via the channel and the only caveat there is that the email address that you give me for access uh, needs to be the one that you access your YouTube account with some people have got either old legacy uh, YouTube uh, email addresses and then their current email address has moved on and then they sometimes don't access it and that's just because I've referenced the wrong email address so if you make sure that you send me, here's my email address. Uh, uh, there's, my, there's my email address. If you make sure you give me your email address that you use for YouTube, then by the time I've uploaded it, and that'll be tomorrow sometime, uh, then <clears throat> bear in mind, I say tomorrow, I know some of you uh, are in Australia and it's already tomorrow, but it's uh, 11 o'clock at night now in the UK. So tomorrow at Sunday, I'll upload that to YouTube and then grant you access and you'll be able to uh, watch this for, for, forever and a day, basically. It's going to sit there for, forever. Um, there was a reference, David mentioned this VIP membership on my Patreon account, which is spelled P A P like that, I think. Um, yeah, there were different, there's different levels basically, David. And um, unless you're a, a VIP member, uh, then basically you don't get, you don't get these, uh, these webinars for free. And it was just a differentiator on there, basically. Uh, and the problem is, is that once I've created that kind of uh, structure, it's, it's obviously not very fair for people that are already part of that scheme to, to sort of, you know, chop their legs away, if you like. So that, that's all that was. OK, any more questions on... Ah, here you go. I have got a Q&A. Cameron, use the Q&A. Well done, Cameron. 
How much difference in pitch on different machines? Uh, yeah, so, um, so basically the pitch of the blades is usually around uh, two degrees angle of attack, static. And uh, the angle that the rotor head will tilt back off my head, I think, and, and, and this is, don't quote me, but it, it'll be somewhere within a few, like literally one or two degrees. I'm pretty sure that auto gyro aircraft is something between 22 and 20 or 24 degrees of tilt back. And a Magni is around 17, 18. So what that means is, um, Basically, if you're fully uh, full back stick with a Magni uh, versus an auto gyro, then it means you, you, you'd effectively have to come a little bit forward stick to get the same combination of angle of attack and, and head angle on an on a auto gyro to a Magni. Um, and in fact, if you fly an auto gyro uh, with big tundra tires, they're sort of big sort of uh, bush tires, uh, they change the head angle to be more like a Magni actually, because otherwise they have some problem with uh, over rotation because obviously the, <coughs> the, uh, the pivot, the, the rotation around those tundra tires uh, changes there. Uh, Horatio says, I've entered with an e the email. Oh, uh, yeah, okay. I didn't see an email. Oh, you didn't see me. Okay. Uh, hang on. Let me... One second. I'll just share the screen. My fault. I on it. Let's go back to this. Share. So, my email address... Let me just make a new slide, text box, there we go. Gyro, uh, cocktail. There you go, pretty straightforward. Gyro, cocktail, flying club at gmail.com. Well, let's make that even bigger. You see that? Oh, yeah, you can see that. Seamless. Gyrocopter Flying Club uh, at gmail.com. So, yeah. Have you got that? Hopefully, yeah. Uh, perfect. So, if you send me an email with your email address that you want for YouTube, uh, I'll add that once I've got it, and then you'll be able to see us talk about this. Ah, here we go. Uh, right. Uh, I don't, I, okay, just to answer the question on the twisted blade angle of instance, uh, I don't think we've got any of those anymore, or I don't, I've not known of any uh, blade twist actually on auto gyro magnet. I don't think there's any, uh, you know, washout if you, if you like. Uh, David, any commentary, rotor RPM point that the brake mode can be engaged? Uh, 150 or lower. Yes, okay, so basically, yeah, that's a quite a good question. So, let me just go back to our presentation. So, obviously, when you start from the hangar in the morning, the, the blades will be stopped. So you'll taxi all the way to the runway with the blade stopped and the rotor brake will be engaged. And at some point you'll have done your pre takeoff check. So typically that's just making sure that the engine is up to temperature and you've done a mag check and you're good to go really. I'm assuming that there's no traffic in the way. And then you take the rotor brake off 
and press the pre-rotator and off you go flying. Then you come and land and the rotor RPM typically once you've landed in an auto gyro, uh, by the time you've really you know, looked at the rotor taco, it's probably about 300 uh, and decaying quite quickly. I would do this. So I've landed, stick is forward and central, and I'm still on the runway at this point. I would sit there with the stick forward and central, and my other hand now is just literally uh, gently on the wheel brake just to stop any uh, forward movement. I would then sit there until the rotor RPM is now decayed less than 150. And the reason I say that is because once it's less than 150, now you can look at where the wind is coming from and deflect the stick towards the wind. If on the other hand, the wind is on the nose, for example, but I'm going to taxi off to the left for, to, to parking, maybe I'll just put the stick over to the right so that when I turn left, the wind doesn't get underneath the disc because this is the area which is quite dangerous because if, for example, we've got a rotor RPM at 150 and we open the disc up to the wind um, so the wind can get underneath the rotor disc. Now the problem becomes the fact that the rotor RPM can get excited because that uh, wind is now, you know, creating uh, auto rotation. And if you are a bit unwary, suddenly you can be taxiing off and now the rotors are back up to, you know, almost flying speed and now you're back to you know rotor thrust and the aircraft toppling over so i've landed stick is fully forward and central i'm just stopped on the runway allowing the rotors to come down to less than 150 and then i just deflect towards the wind now that process from you know landing stick forward and central to less than 150, it's probably gonna take no more than 20 or 30 seconds. And it's way better. In fact, you've inspired me to, let me just show you a video as to what and I'm not sure if people watch all of these videos because I know that there's a lot on there now. But you should try and uh, you should try and watch these things. Let's just have a look at let's just try and look at this one. Right. Stop sharing, share this one, share. Right, so you can all see this little video here. And one of the things I was saying is these people that have just landed just need to be aware. So this guy's in a Magni. Now Magni Rotor Taco is, where is it? Uh, I think it is. It's a digital tacker. There it is. It's down there. You see, look. And this guy, <coughs> he was now messing with his stick retainer. If I'm in a Magni and I've got a stick retainer, I wouldn't put the stick retainer on until the rotor RPM has uh, decayed. Uh, significantly because at the moment look he's still got over 200 rotor rpm and now he's got his stick retainer on if he needs to actually manage that now he's just battling the stick retainer so that's the one snag the next snag look oh, this is a guy called well would you believe it this is actually 
Sadly, this guy is dead. This guy called Chris Lord. This is the Oshkosh look. Straight away he's landed. Now he's messing with his rotor brake. And, you know, straight away just taxiing off the, off the runway. This guy here, look, straight away, look, he's just landed, rotor, rotor flight to brake, goes to brake, and now look what he does. There's a rotor taco up here, look, and that's saying that he's got 300. That, that's, three, that's a 300 graduation, and look what he does. He's now straight away, look, doing a 180 backtrack. I mean, it's just insanity. I mean, it really is insanity. And the problem is, is that these things go wrong. If you mismanage the rotors when they've got uh, a lot of energy, uh, it goes wrong so fast that you just will not able, you, you are unable to react in time. Uh, once the aircraft has got to the point where it can roll, uh, then your, uh, your fate is uh, is completely is completely sealed so you're much better to come to a complete stop let the energy come from the rotors and then deflect the stick into wind uh, and then you'll never you're never going to have a you're never going to have a problem um you know and that unfortunately you know that's one of the one of the things about my channel my youtube channel is it bangs the same drum often over and over again about very obvious, simple things, really, uh, because none of this is particularly complicated. But you do need to have um, an element of, uh, of rigor around what you do so that you don't snag. And that's one of the problems that's happening in America. It isn't the fact that people can't learn to fly a gyroplane after 10 to 15 hours if they're already a pilot because to be honest with you a lot of what happens in a gyroplane um, absolutely is similar to a fixed wing you know the landing process is almost identical actually to a fixed wing but the problem is is that unless you've gone through those actions over and over again they're not ingrained um, and, and, and when they're not ingrained you, you know, you, you fall over and people get snagged. Um, and, you know, I mentioned earlier, just a moment ago, uh, the guy, Chris Lord, who sadly uh, got killed. And he didn't kill him, he, actually, even worse. He didn't just kill himself, he killed his passenger. And that was completely uh, because he was far, far too casual uh, with something as fundamental as a, as a basic uh, check, a, you know, a daily check on the aircraft. And, uh, it, and it cost him and his passenger their, their lives. And, and he got, what, 4,000 hours. So that's the problem. Yeah, sorry, in terms of a number, David, for that rotor brake, I don't put the rotor brake on uh, until, uh, well, okay, so hang on. Let's just, there's two things here. The reason, the reason that these guys here, sorry, let me just go back. Um, where am I? The reason, sorry, I'm trying to find, I'm just trying to find something. Sorry about this, I'm, I realise that I am waffling. Share screen. Right, we're back on this, we're back on this video, aren't we? Here we go. So the reason, for example, that Chris Lord here goes to, goes to break, and the reason that this guy goes to break, just there, is less because he's actually putting the rotor brake on, but what he's doing, he's dumping any, uh, any aft trim pressure. Because obviously that knob, when it's in flight, what it's actually doing is meaning the pneumatics 
uh, are giving some aft stick. Whereas when it goes on to break, uh, it dumps all the trim pressure and it allows the, the rotor head to come fully forward. That's, that's, why, they do, that's why they're doing uh, what they're doing. They're not actually uh, pumping the rotor breaker. For me, going from flight to brake, I think, I think certainly this guy has gone too early. I think he just needs to relax himself. Um, but in terms of actually putting the brake on, probably I wouldn't want to do it until it's less than 100. Uh, just because you're just, just too aggressive uh, on, the, on the brake system. So that's that. Right, cool. Any more for any more? Any more questions? Ah, yeah, sorry, Cameron, it dropped off the bottom. Right, here we go. Time to Yeah, yeah, so what Cameron's saying is that we should look to do some uh, gyro gliding. And, um, yeah, <coughs> <coughs> I would agree, actually, um, and it's something that, as Cameron probably knows, uh, my winter project, if I don't die of this bloody, <laughs> this virus, is I'm in the, I'm building, I'm actually going to build uh, a little gyro glider for myself, uh, just for fun, over the winter, and uh, that's fun. One of the problems and the reason for the demise, and um, actually, let me, let me just find a little bit of gyro gliding for people that don't know what I'm talking about, because it is quite good fun. Um, where am I? There we go. So, let me just share this screen. So here you go. So back in the old days, there we go. This is obviously an early single seat uh, gyroplane, but they wouldn't start. Uh, on a powered aircraft in the old days, they would start on something called a gyro glider, which is like this. Let's see, this is towed behind some, well, I don't know what that is, but you can see that he's just being towed into the air. And uh, actually, look, this has got two different controls. Look, one was a, a hanging stick, the other was a conventional joystick. And obviously, this guy would just get a lot of feel, you know, control movement and control feel so that he could be more accurate with uh, his flying when he transitioned to powered flight. Now, of course, one of the problems and why this isn't particularly uh, prevalent these days is mainly because. Number one, we just don't really have the venues to be able to do it anymore because fundamentally uh, all of our old airfields that would have been suitable uh, have been ripped up and redeveloped into industrial units or uh, residential housing. I mean, obviously in the UK, we had, a, we had a, an enormous amount of uh, aviation venues and airfields uh, because of the Second World War, and then obviously over through the 70s, 80s, and even even as recent as sort of today, really, uh, those things have just been redeveloped for housing as that becomes a greater demand. And then the other problem is even those that do exist, uh, there's just a, an enormous amount of, of issue around... Um, you know, noise and, and, and health and safety. You know, in the old days, if you uh, saw someone doing that up and down an old runway, 
I'm sure people would probably happily spend an afternoon watching the uh, the activities. Whereas nowadays, people are just busy bodies, and uh, you know they're just not very happy to see that happen. And uh, they'll likely complain to the local council, and then it all comes to a grinding halt. So yeah, it is difficult. And and the other thing is is that people are just not that keen on spending the time and the energy to to do uh, these things. You know, I, I, it's actually a big problem, uh, not just in uh, powered flight, but also in um, in gliding. You know, traditional glider clubs are actually starting to fade simply because uh, the traditional model of gliding is if you went to, if you wanted to go and use uh, a club glider then the deal would have been that you'll spend all day you know getting the aircraft out of the hangar uh, sitting in the bus strapping people in uh, attaching the winch you know retrieving the uh, the cable and so on and then at the end of the day uh, you know you'll have a go in the in the club aircraft um, and people just don't want to spend all day uh, at an airfield you know doing you know messing around because at some point you know they've got to see the kids or they've got the wife asking what to do you know what they're going to be doing this weekend and blah blah and there's just different pressures i'm afraid uh, so uh, yeah a lot of gliding is is kind of struggling so hey ho the good thing is is that we sh we should be aware of of all of these little snags and that's the the best way that we can uh, we can avoid falling into them Happy days. Well, nice to see everybody again. And hopefully uh, next month when we do another one of these uh, things, we're all still here. None of us have succumbed to the dreaded virus or, or alternatively boredom because we're not doing anything. Um, one thing actually I would say is, uh, especially for those in the Northern Hemisphere, if you are more than you know two or three hours from getting your gyroplane license my advice to you would be to stop uh, and then to re-engage after the winter and the reason i say that is because it's highly likely that if the weather doesn't disrupt your flight training uh, the virus may disrupt your flight training and there doesn't seem to be a lot of point you know if you're let's let's assume you're 10 or 15 hours into trying to get your license uh, there doesn't seem to be a lot of point spending the money to do another five or six hours through october and maybe a little bit in november because obviously Christmas gets in the way of December and, uh, and the weather certainly gets in the way of January normally. Um, you know, so there's not much point adding another five hours because by the time you re-emerge, and goodness knows if the virus takes hold over the winter, when things are going to re-emerge, you know, you just thrown a load of money on the bonfire uh, just, for, just for the sake of it. So my advice would be, if you're further than about four or five hours from a license, you may as well stop and wait until 2021 gives you a bit more clarity as to what it's going to be like uh, for the virus and the weather and then re-engage properly and, and get it all done. Because again, repetition and doing these things often, especially if we go back to our little presentation, which is where... Hang on, back here. Close it down. Let me, let me just show you what I was about to show you. There was just nothing more complicated than, than that. Remember our currency chart. Obviously, you may as well just wait until your. Uh, able to get it all done in one go all right guys if there's no more questions i'm going to turn in for the evening have a cup of cocoa 
and uh, and retire. Thanks, Cameron. Good to see you, and uh, I'm good to see that you're all well in Australia. Of course, the sun's coming over there, so you're going to be on the beach doing some prawns. Cheers, guys. Glad you enjoyed it. Any questions uh, on the email, and uh, and I'll send uh, links to the video on the YouTube so you can watch it all again to your heart's content. And uh, nice to have your company. Good night, all. Take care.